Hello and welcome to another video tutorial from Four Corners Education. Uh, this one is for Topic 2 Ecosystems in Ecology from the IB Diploma Environmental Systems and Societies course. And in particular Topic 2.1 Species and Population. Um, this subtopic is quite a long subtopic. So it will be uploaded as a set of videos rather than just one single continuous video. Um, it also doesn't include every bit of topic 2.1. I'm focusing mainly on the interactions rather than definitions, etc, etc. So let's make a start with the main ideas. Okay, there's three main ideas that really run through this subtopic. The first is that species interact with their environment, with both the abiotic and the biotic environment. We'll define those later. And the niche of the species is described by these interactions. Again, we're going to define the term niche later on. Uh, populations change and respond to these interactions. And any system has its own carrying capacity. So these interactions lead to something called a carrying capacity for a given species. So I've given you a possible TOK type question here to think about. So we have this idea of a species concept, but after we've defined it and looked at it, how does that really, really fit for asexual organisms? Can we really use this species con this idea of a species when we're thinking about asexual organisms? So what do we mean by a species? Well, we're going to see three images. All of these look like cows. However, only two of them actually are cows. There are two species of cows in these images, and the third one is a wildebeest. Whilst they're related, they're not the same species. There's slight differences between the two cows that are shown. One has really long horns, the other doesn't, etc. But the wildebeest, whilst it looks cow-like, is not a cow. And our definition for a species is a group of organisms that interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Um, I'm not entirely sure if cows and wildebeest can interbreed, but if they can, they will produce sterile offspring in the same way that when horses and, horses and donkeys interbreed, the mule that's created is actually sterile, so they can't produce fertile offspring. So one reason to recognise a species might be that it might save your life. So being able to recognise different fungus species actually really could save your life. And while a lot of fungus look very, very similar, there are discrete differences. And some very, very edible looking fungus are actually highly poisonous. Okay, this idea of species, as I alluded to earlier, has problems. One problem that exists is, is, is really the definition is now a little bit outdated. Since genetics has altered the way that we look at species, uh, we're starting to find out new things about things that we thought of as being the same species. So, for instance, reindeer and caribou are thought of as the same species. Reindeer and car caribou can interbreed. However, recent research has started to suggest that they are actually more like related close species rather than being the same species. And that's actually altering the way that we think about species. If you follow the QR code, there's quite an interesting article on that. Okay, so as I said in the introduction, species tend to live in habitats. Well, that's a bit obvious. And we're going to have a quick look at a couple of examples of different habitats just to get our head around the idea of what we mean by that. So the first one is a maritime cliff environment next to the sea. Uh, the environment has a lot of salt in it. Um, it gets quite hot in, on any south-facing area. And all of the plants that live there are actually buffeted by the, the wind. So as you can see, all the plants are very, very small. They're very low lying. They're all sheltering in nooks and crannies within the rocks. So they're adapted to live inside that environment. Uh, the next one, again, very low lying plants, an alpine grassland environment covered in snow in the winter, only gets uncovered in the summer quite high up a mountain, so there's a lot of wind there. You can see there are actually some paragliders in the background, so it's, uh, so it's quite a windy environment. So again, very, very few trees and quite low-lying shrubs and grasses. And another low-lying environment for similar sorts of reasons, estuarine wetlands, dominated by grasses, mosses, uh, very, very boggy. It's a tidal area, so quite often the tide comes up over the top of some of these areas, so the species that live there have to be able to survive in quite a salt condition. 
and tropical rainforest, entirely different sort of habitat. Uh, tall trees, very densely packed together. As you can see even from this picture, there's quite a lot of different species, high biodiversity, um, different layers within, within the canopy, etc, etc. And our final quick look at this idea of habitats is actually man-made agricultural habitats. Um, we quite often dismiss these in our heads and don't think about them, but this is home to quite a lot of organisms. Um, this is, these are rice, rice fields in Vietnam, and yeah, there's all sorts of things that actually live in the rice fields. Okay, so I used the term niche earlier. So what do we mean by this idea, this thing called a niche? Well, a niche is, a, is, is the share of a habitat and the resources in it that a species uses. Um, an, an organism's ecological niche depends not only on where it lives, but on what it does in that environment. So we're talking about the interactions inside there. So what might make up the niche? Well, all organisms need space. They all need food. They all are adapted to live in different climates. And the list goes on. Um, so you can think in terms of something like a peregrine falcon. A peregrine falcon needs space to hunt. It needs the availability of prey that it can catch. It needs nesting sites, etc., etc. So the total amount of resources that a population needs is called its theoretical niche. Yeah, this would be the ideal conditions in which to live. However, not all environments provide the ideal conditions. So we have limits on the niche compared to what is actually available. So the actual resources the population might be using is called its realized niche. And it's using those resources because that's what it has access to. So the fundamental niche is probably going to be bigger. Yeah. In terms of human populations, we could think about this as populations in areas where famine is quite common. Uh, for the population to survive and prosper really, really well, if we could remove those famines, uh, the population would, would grow much quicker. However, the population doesn't disappear because of the famine. The population is just re reduced. They're using less resources. Those are the re that's the idea of a realized niche. And this realized niche imposes a set of limits on population size. Competition between species creates a pressure on the realized niche. So there's two very simple examples here. We've got two species. And in the first example, the resource overlap, the resources that both species are actually competing for, is much smaller than in the second example. And I've only drawn circles upon species two to sort of illustrate this better. But you can see the realized niche of species two in the second example is much smaller than it is in the first example. That's because the competition between species one and species two is greater. The greater the competition between the species for the same resources, the smaller the realized niche is compared to the fundamental niche. And competition doesn't just have to be between different species. Competition can also be between species of the same uh, between members of the same species. So if competition is too great between different species, one species may outcompete the other species. But if competition is too great within a species, the population itself could collapse. So let's have a look at an example of this. In the 1960s, the ecologist Joseph Connell made some observations about distribution of barnacles on rocky shores in California. And what he discovered was, or what he saw, what he observed was that one species Balanus was found mainly on the lower shore, between the high and low tide marks, whereas the second species, Cathalmus, was mainly on the upper shore. However, the larva of each species were able to swim anywhere on the rocky shore. So they should be able to survive anywhere with inside that. Uh, so what he did, he came up with a research question, and his research question was this, why are they not found together? 
What is the reason that they aren't found together, they don't overlap each other? So let's illustrate that. So this is a quick diagram to sort of show what he found. So um, both species could live in a quite an extended range and Balanus could actually live between high tide and, and low tide. Cathalmus was restricted a little bit, but actually could live in a much greater range than it seemed to live. And where they were on beaches together, they didn't actually overlap each other. That Balan Balanus was always found on the lower shore, and Cathalmus was always found in the very top end of the upper, upper shore. So what Joseph Connell proposed is that where they were was actually their realised niche that there was competition happening between them. So he needed to conduct some experiments to see if his, if his thoughts were correct on this. So, in his first experiment, he removed Cathalmus from the top of the shore, but Balanus did not replace it. Um, his conclusion was that Balanus needed to be in the tidal area and could not survive in the often dry periods that happened of the highest tides. Yeah? So, the realised niche for Balanus was the same as its fundamental niche. That was the first thing that he actually concluded. The second was they removed Balanus from the top of the shore and Cathalmus replaced it. Uh, sorry, removed Balanus from the bottom of the shore and Cathalmus replaced it. So his conclusion was that Balanus was outcompeted by Cathalmus in the lower tidal areas. Cathalmus has a smaller realised niche than its fundamental niche because of the competition from Balanus. What Connell had shown was that together, the biotic interactions between these individuals explain the actual conditions and the resources in which the species exist as its realised niche. So these two species were competing for very, very similar resources. So therefore, they ended up in different parts of the beach or in different niches. Okay, I've been talking a lot about biotic and abiotic factors, so what do we...